Now that was an example that you're familiar with. I'm about to give you an example that you're not familiar with. So, let's see. We have some, yeah, I'll, I'll fit it under here. I want you to draw a little set of axes, like so. I'm mostly just drawing the top half and not worrying too much about the bottom half. That's a bit of a spoiler, but we'll see how we go. Now the graph I want you to put on here is one that I doubt you've encountered before, which is why we're going to do some work with it. This is the graph we're going to consider. y equals, it's very simple, x to the power of 2 thirds. x to the power of 2 thirds. Okay? So if we think about this guy, what does it look like? Mm. Not dealt with uh, objects like this before. When you in get introduced to a function and you literally know nothing about it, you're like, it's not a trig function, which I know what they look like. It's not a hyperbola, which I know what they look like, or a parabola, or anything like that. What, what, what kind of tools do you have at your disposal to work out what kind of picture you should draw? I could plot points. That should always be your first go-to, like, I've got no idea to do, what to do. I'm just going to put some numbers in. Okay? And it turns out it's quite easy to put some numbers into this. Give me a number you'd like to put in x equals 1, sure. If x equals 1, then y equals 1 to the power of 2 thirds. What does that mean? Well, what is the power of 2 thirds anyway? Well, uh, you could say it a couple of different ways. One of the ways you could say it is it's the cube root of 1 squared. Is that okay? That's what fractional indices mean. Yeah? We know what 1 squared is. And you know what the cube root of that number is as well, don't you? What is that number? Cube root, cube root, think. It's the number you multiply by itself to give you, what is 1 squared after all? It's, it's 1, right? What, what is that number? There's only one possible value. It's, it's 1, right? Last I checked, 1 times 1 times 1 is 1, okay? So I've got an x coordinate and a y coordinate. Why don't we put that on? Okay, I get it. It's, um, it's Monday morning. <laughs> My brain's not going. Okay, give me another value. Come on, something easy. <coughs> Zero. Zero is an important value to try out. We'll get some intercepts out of this. If x equals zero, then y equals, whoop, I missed. y equals zero to the power of two thirds. Cube root of zero squared. Come on, you guys can tell me what that is. That's, that's zero. Okay, so this goes to the origin. Okay. Um, mm. Now, I, I can keep doing this for a while. Plotting points, there's nothing wrong with it. However, one of the reasons why we don't like to plot points is it's somewhat time consuming for very little information. Like you don't get much quickly out of this. Think about the topic that we're in. Do we have like any better tools that we can use that might get us a better picture of this quicker? Maybe we could differentiate this thing. That would be a novel idea in a topic which has calculus in its name. Okay, you go ahead. I'm going to make some, myself some space. You know how to differentiate this. You know the rules that can help you deal with this. Differentiate that and then let's see what we get. It is warming up already. Okay, you guys can help me out. Um, I've already started, but I haven't finished. We know to differentiate things with powers. You take the power, you bring it out the front, and then what happens to the power that remains? You minus one. Now, be careful, right? Two thirds minus one is not a third. <laughs> That's a very common error. Uh, Two thirds minus one is negative a third. That's a little bit weird. Okay, this is a bit of a garbled mess right now. Let's neaten this up. When you've got a negative power, what does that mean? Like x to the minus 1 is, is a fraction. It's 1 over x, yeah? So I'm going to write this without the negative indices because they hurt my brain. Um, I'm going to put that x on the denominator. So I get, with the 3, I've got x to the power of a third. Are you okay with that? dealt with that. And at the same time, I might as well get rid of that fraction as well. So this is 2 on 3 times what? This is the cube root of x. Very good. Okay, that's, that's a bit weird and awkward, but I can use this. I can work out what's going on. I can get a much better idea of what is happening to this faster than just putting points, which will literally take me forever. Okay. 
I've got a power of x on the denominator, okay? As x gets bigger, like if I were to put in x equals 2, 3, 4, 5, a million, etc., okay? I'm trying to think about limiting behavior. The denominator is going to get larger and larger and larger, right? If the denominator of something gets larger, what's that mean about the whole object? What's that mean about the whole fraction? The whole thing is approaching 0, okay? So that means as x goes that way, right, the limit as x approaches infinity of my derivative, what's that equal to? Well, you just told me it's going to approach 0. When something approaches 0, uh, the derivative that is, what does that mean about the graph? What kind of shape are you getting? It's, um, it's leveling out, isn't it? It's slowing down. Does it ever actually get to 0? It does not, because the denominator, there's no value you can put into the denominator to make the whole thing zero. So you never actually become stationary, but you get pretty close, right? It's going to really flatten out. All right, so now I know what's happening over there. Where else might be an interesting spot that I could look? Where else could I look? How about negative infinity? Let's, let's look on this side, okay? Now, when you think about the limit as x approaches negative infinity, well, Tell me what's happening to that denominator. If I put in a number like negative a million in there, something like that, can we, can we evaluate that? Does it make sense? Y you can, right? Uh, in fact, the cube root of negative a million, I'm pretty sure, is negative 100, right? Negative 100 times negative 100 times negative 100. That'll give you negative a million. So you're still getting a really, really large, in, in size, large denominator. So what's happening to the whole thing? It's, it's still approaching zero, right? Ah, but it's approaching it in a different way, isn't it? What was the cube root of negative a million? It's, it's negative 100. It's not positive 100, right? So this is actually going to be a positive small value. But this guy down here, owing to that minus sign, this is a negative small value. Right? Think back to your first lesson in this topic. When you get a negative derivative, even if it's very, very small, what does negative derivative tell you? It's decreasing. Very good. So it's decreasing over here. It's increasing over here. You've got a picture. Decreasing, increasing. I don't know anything else yet, but that already tells me I'm in this neck of the woods. Does that make sense? Change in the sign. Okay. The last question is, what happens when I get in here? That's the middle of the graph. That seems like something interesting might happen. You tell me. As x gets tiny, as I get closer and closer to x equals 0, what's going on with that derivative? I asked you what happened when this got big. You told me the whole thing got small, yeah, which is true. Now I'm asking what happens when this gets small. Well, the whole thing will become big. Right? So when you have the whole derivative being a very, very large number, like a derivative of 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 million, right? what does that tell you about the shape of the graph? Like, what, what's the difference between, say, this graph, which has a gradient of 1, and this graph, which has a gradient which is substantially larger than 1? How would you describe that to someone? That's going to look closer and closer and closer to a vertical line, isn't it? It's got, it rises a lot for a very small run. Does that make sense? So okay, now are you starting to form a mental picture, right? It's decreasing gently over here, over here. It's increasing gently over here, but right in the middle, something crazy is happening. It's being super, super steep, okay? Are you ready to draw the picture? Here's what it's going to look like. What is that? Well, before I tell you what it is, uh, in terms of language I know, you can tell me what it is in terms of language you know. It's going down, and then it's going up. So what is it? That's the turning point, right? It clearly turns, OK? But it doesn't turn in the way that any of these guys do, yeah? Um, it doesn't, it certainly has no like, nice, gentle, you know, stationary part of it, OK? So it's not a stationary point. Um, it's not even this. It's not a piecemeal function. It's one function. It's defined consistently across its entire domain. So it's not because it's a piecemeal function. We call this object, you can add this to your, um, your Venn diagram now. 
We call this object, object a cusp, C-U-S-P, okay, it's a cusp. Uh, to be fair, it is a very, very mathematically uncommon object, doesn't happen a whole lot, but it does happen. And in fact, it doesn't, you don't need something weird and complicated to create it. You guys can understand all of that. Okay. So if you want to put your example there, um, x to the power of two thirds is the most common example that gets pulled out. Okay. 